British railways are the busiest in the world, and yet they lose enough money to put something like ninepence on the income tax. Now, the British Railways Board, under the chairmanship of Dr. Richard Peaching, have completed the investigations they were asked to make and published their proposal. We found ourselves some 18 months ago uh, in a position where we hadn't got nearly enough information to enable us to know how the railways ought really to work. And we spent the first uh, period, very nearly a year altogether, collecting this information and analyzing it, costing present-day railway operations and costing future ones that we had in mind as a part of the reshaped pattern. These maps uh, show the distribution of traffic all over British railways. One of them shows passenger traffic and the other freight. And the thickness of the lines is drawn so that they indicate the density of the traffic on every route. This one, which is the freight map, shows that there's plenty of freight moving between the big cities, between the industrialized areas, between the places where the big concentrations of population are. But you see, in areas like East Anglia, and Wales, and the West Country, and in the North, and away into Scotland, there is very little traffic indeed. And the position is almost the same with passengers. When we came to analyze the information that went into the making of these maps, we found some very interesting things. And I think that I can make the uh, most striking of them clear to you if I tell you that on one half of the whole route mileage of British Railways, there is only one twentieth of the traffic. Now this is true of the passenger traffic, but it's also true of freight. And we find that wherever there is little passenger traffic, then there's very little freight either. And, of course, this is ominous from the point of view of the future of those lines. But it is very encouraging from the point of view of the railways as a business, as a living organization, because it offers us the prospect of being able to cut out a very large part of the route mileage with a very high cost associated with it and still keep 95% of the traffic on what is left. Of course, some of you will say, well, what about all this modernization? Can't we have uh, the branch lines as well? Can't you attract enough traffic to them to make them pay? But unfortunately, we can't. This has been tried. A very high proportion of them have had new rolling stock, diesel multiple units, put on them. And we cannot make them pay because the traffic is not there and so many people have motor cars. Now, some of you will say that with a public service, profitability isn't the only yardstick, that it isn't the only measure of value or even of efficiency. And of course it isn't. So I don't want to argue about that. But the real issue is different. The real question is whether you, as owners of the railways, want us to go on running these services at very high cost when the demand for them has very largely disappeared. Suppose we consider a railway line that carries 5,000 passengers a week, but little or no freight. At the very least, the route cost, that is the cost of maintaining the track itself and the various installations, amounts to 50 pounds per week per mile. Then there's the movement cost of a reasonably frequent train service, another 100 pounds a week per route mile. Total outlay, 150 pounds a week. On the credit side, we have the passengers with an average fare of rather more than tuppence a mile. With 5,000 passengers, this brings in a total of certainly less than 50 pounds per week per route mile. So a line such as this is being run at a loss of over 100 pounds a week per mile. And there are 52 weeks in the year. How did a situation like this arise? Our railways grew up in competition with the horse and cart. It was an easy commercial battle to win. A 
surefire commercial proposition and a fine investment. Capital flowed in, and soon we had the most closely meshed railway network in the world. Branch lines carried goods as well as passengers from almost anywhere to almost anywhere else. It was the only way to do it. This meant building a system for countrywide handling of small consignments involving hundreds of small goods depots, each serving an area which could conveniently be covered by horse and cart collection and delivery. Now, this whole vast network, once so vital, is vital no longer. Much of the country's transport needs can be provided by other means, often more convenient, sometimes more efficient. Yet throughout the country we are still moving tiny separate consignments of freight stage by stage from one marshalling yard to the next. Individual wagons doing a slow motion stop-go in ever-changing combinations. Even today, railway wagons often form part of as many as six trains in the course of their journey. Think of the cost of it. And think, too, of the competing lorry going from door to door. Standing. 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 Then a short journey and standing again. And we're still suffering an enormous financial loss on the stopping passenger train, which utilizes a lot of expensive equipment to carry a handful of passengers a few miles rather slowly. And meantime, holds up other trains that could travel faster if they had the chance. As a result of all this, the Railways Board proposes that many services should be withdrawn and many hundreds of stations and depots be closed. In proposing the uh, closing down of stations and services, we are only recommending the continuation of a process that's gone on for some time. The railways, for many years now, have been losing traffic to uh, road vehicles, to the private car, to the bus, and to the lorry. And this closure of uh, services is a necessary part, or at least a necessary accompaniment, of the other process of building up the good parts of the railway, those parts that carry nearly all the traffic now. And in the country areas, it's doubtful whether the railways carry as much as 10% of the traffic that there is. Uh, you can see that if you just look at this map. These are the bus services at present operating. And look how dense they are. Now, the survey uh, on which this map was based showed that nearly all the rail services which we intend to cut out run parallel with bus services. And even when they don't, it's very much cheaper to run a bus instead of the railway. And therefore, if there is a, a social need for some minimum level of service, it's really much better to provide it by bus. It's the bus stations in many parts of the country that are busy, not the country railway station. And we've had this very much in mind in framing our proposals. We're not proposing to shut down services simply because they don't pay. We've had it very much in mind that we should shape the railway as part of a national transport system and shape it to do the thing that people appear to want it to do by the use they make of it. Of course, closing down a large part of the railway's route system, even though it's the least important part, is bound to affect the jobs of a good many railwaymen. And I don't want to minimize the importance of this, but there are a number of factors which make it less serious, but less worrying than many people expected it might be. You see, last year we brought down the uh, total staff by about 26,000, and the number of men who actually had to be discharged to do this was a very much smaller number. This is made possible by the fact that the 
railways have a very considerable natural wastage. Uh, we normally have to replace about 80,000 men a year. Uh, this wastage, of course, takes place because people uh, retire, some die, and a good many move away quite voluntarily to take other jobs. By taking advantage of this wastage and strictly controlling recruitment, we can bring down the numbers very considerably year by year without uh, discharging people. So that to bring down the numbers in future, we hope not to have to discharge a great many. At the same time, uh, there is a problem uh, arising from the fact that uh, railwaymen who are displaced from their existing jobs will not necessarily be uh, displaced in just the same places as wastage occurs. We know that this won't be so, and that a good many men, if they're to remain in the employment of the railways, will have to move from place to place. Uh, where, for some reason, they can't move, or they're unwilling to do so, then uh, there will be uh, compensation to them uh, according to terms that have uh, recently been agreed with the unions. Uh, under these arrangements, uh, long service members of the staff who have to go and leave us will receive substantial lump sums uh, when they go and will continue to receive payments and supplementation of their unemployment pay for periods of up to a year. Where, on the other hand, uh, people do move, then they will uh, be assisted uh, in connection with their removal expenses. And uh, if, as a result of the move, they have to step down a grade, they will be paid for a period of five years at the rate appropriate to their former grade. And this, of course, they can be reinstated in that grade in the meantime. Again, where men have to go and leave us, we shall give them good notice. And during that notice, they will be able to travel free and in paid time to look for other jobs. In all these ways, we shall try to reduce hardship where it arises. And of course, we shall do all that we can to reduce the number of men affected to a minimum. But now, on the positive side, uh, I would like to say this. We are building a new railway. We have a clear plan. And this will mean uh, two things. It will remove the sense of uncertainty that has affected railwaymen for a good many years now. And it will give them the stimulus of working for a growing, developing, healthy organization. To decide on the right shape for the railways of the future, it is necessary first to decide what things a railway can do best. First, we have to consider the uh, special characteristics which distinguish railways as a form of transport. The most important of them, obviously, is that uh, a railway depends upon the provision of a specialized track system. With its own exclusive track, completely under its own control, it can run heavily loaded trains non-stop, very fast and very frequently between distant points. Not coaches, not wagons, but trains. The train is the economic railway unit, not the wagon. Full trains mean spreading the movement cost per unit and making it cheap. Dense flows mean spreading the route cost and making that cheap too. But if, on the other hand, the trains are infrequent and their loading is poor, very few passengers, very few tons of freight, then uh, railways become a very expensive form of transport. We have to have this very much in mind when we consider shaping the route system. So, on the passenger side, the proposal is to go for development and improvement in the intercity services. It is believed that they will come to be recognized as easily the best form of transport to be used between our great centers of population and business. The intention is to raise all these intercity services to the level of the best of the named trains, and then go beyond them in efficiency and comfort.
there are the suburban services. Yes, it looks as if it ought to be profitable, doesn't it? And here's the reason it isn't. This is the price to be paid in the long off-peak hours for the brief morning and evening rushes. Expensive rolling stock idle, staff still on hand, but scarcely anyone travelling. I'm sure you'll all be relieved to hear whether you're commuters, motorists, or even traffic duty policemen, that we don't intend to close down uh, suburban lines, even though we lose money on quite a lot of them. This is traffic that we handle better than anywhere else in the world, and we like doing it so long as the price is right. But you mustn't be surprised if we try to get the price a little righter than it is at the moment in the future. And this is important, too, from the passenger's point of view, because if the fares are too low, the overcrowding will go on getting worse, and not enough money will come in to enable us to improve the services, and increase their capacity. So it matters to you if the fares are too low. But the all-important thing is freight. That's what matters to our revenue. Already, British railways have been getting rid of small marshalling yards and replacing whole groups of them with a single magnificently equipped yard fitted with the latest electrical devices. Then there are to be seen big, modern goods depots that have already taken the place of some of the multiplicity of small ones that were part of the historical clutter. This kind of thing uh, is important because it will help to uh, improve the flow. But the really important thing uh, is uh, to get a lot more through train movement. The benefits of through train movement are well demonstrated by certain improvements already made in the handling of coal. Of the 150 million tons of coal carried by rail, about two-thirds goes to power stations and large industrial consumers. And already about half of that is going not in odd wagon loads, but in block trains. The coal which goes to smaller industrial users and to the domestic consumer goes by the wagon load to thousands of small terminals. For these terminals are being substituted a few coal concentration depots which can be fed in train load quantities and have a throughput high enough to justify highly efficient mechanical handling equipment and specialized road vehicles. What is being done with coal can be done with the other heavy traffics that move in bulk often in special purpose rolling stock. But there are believed to be even greater opportunities in the field of general merchandise. At the moment, we are carrying about 40 million tons a year of general merchandise. And it's in this field that the room for expansion is to be found. And this map shows how at least twice this quantity travels on road at the present time. And it moves over routes that are parallel with the main railway lines. And what's more, we've only shown that proportion of the total which is favorable for rail transport. And so there's a lot for us to go after. But to get it, we shall have to introduce quite new and much better services. British railways are after the large regular flows of big consignments from single points of origin. Regular scheduled trains will be introduced with predictable transit times of 12 hours or less. Sometimes they will be of special purpose stock. Where traffic justifies it, they can be operated as company trains and painted in livery of the customer's choice. Where a heavy demand is irregular, charter trains can operate, like chartered ships. And for traffic not moving in regular large consignments, but where the aggregate flow is considerable, there will be liner trains. The speed freight service is an early small-scale example of the liner train system. Basically, the trains will consist of permanently coupled flat wagons carrying containers fast and regularly from point to point or around a loop route embracing key centers. This map shows some of the routes planned for payloads of 300 tons at average speeds of 50 miles an hour 
with 20 minute intermediate stops for loading and unloading containers and two hour turnarounds at the terminal. The customer can see the goods into the container on his own premises and be sure they will have a reliable shock-free journey to their destination where they will be again unloaded. The vital link which turns the rail journey into a door-to-door -door journey is the transfer gear to be used at the rail centres. It will have to cope with a large number of containers in a matter of minutes, quickly and perhaps simultaneously. At present the engineers are experimenting with various devices but some form of gantry may well be finally adopted. At present, our wagon load, general merchandise traffic, causes us to lose about 32 million pounds a year. But by 1970, if by then we've got an extensive liner train system working, we expect that we shall be able to carry a large part of this same merchandise and other traffic of a similar kind, which we will attract from the roads, and make a profit in the process of about 12 million. A very big improvement. And to sum up our freight plan as a whole, we expect that we shall be able to operate a system which will carry more tonnage than it does at the moment, and that we shall have a system which will do that profitably. To do this, we shall strike a new balance between road and rail. In some places where the traffic is light on the roads now, we shall in fact push some traffic from the railways onto the roads. But in other places, on the trunk routes where the road traffic is very heavy, uh, we aim to draw freight back onto the railways, and there it will be very welcome. Let me say one final thing. In all our planning, we haven't forgotten that railways are there to serve people, and that they're run by people. We haven't forgotten the human side, nor have we forgotten the old British pride in railways. What we intend to do is to strike a balance which will enable uh, each of the forms of transport to do those things which it can do best. And it seems to us that this is the right way to shape the transport system as a whole.